I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today, we're going to look at a wonderful, truly bizarre creature that I think is the most intriguing candidate that we have running for the Super Predator title, Thylacosmilus atrox, the pouched saber-tooth. And the big question we're asking today is whether this fantastically toothy beast was a proud, card-carrying super predator or a lowly, gut-sucking scavenger. But just quickly, before we address this question, a quick rundown on exactly who, where and when Thylacosmilus was. Well, it was a South American Sparacidon metatherian, i.e. as close as living relatives are marsupials, and like marsupials, it probably had a pouch. Thylacosmilus has been found mostly in Argentinian deposits, ranging in age from around 8 million to perhaps as recently as 2.5 million years ago. It was a big carnivore, weighing in at around 80 to 120 kilos, about the size of a jaguar. If you want a bit more information on its closest South American relatives, that's all available on my previous episode on the poor little marsupial saber tooth that nobody heard about. Now, what we're really going to focus on here is whether this was a real predator or just a bottom feeding scavenger that just happened to look badass. This has emerged as a real controversy in recent years among wee boffins. And I have to say up front, as a guy who's published a few papers on Thylacosmilus, I've got skin in the game here. So without further ado, I'll outline the arguments and then give you my opinion. As I mentioned in an earlier episode I did on Smilodon, the saber-tooth design is one that's evolved independently at least four times among mammals. But Thylacosmilus took it to the next level. For its size, its canines are frankly ridiculous. As you can see here, the roots of these canines extend almost back into the brain cavity, way more than in the saber-toothed cat. Not only that, but these ridiculous teeth never stop growing, like the front teeth of a rodent. Unsurprisingly, because Thylacosmilus is so weird, it's always been controversial, but this latest little paleo spat has been sparked by this paper by Christine Janus and colleagues in 2020. Christine argued that Thylacosmilus didn't have what it takes to be a predator at all, let alone a super predator. And to add insult to injury, she and her colleagues argued that Thylacosmilus was a skulking scaredy cat scavenger. Incidentally, the argument that Thylacosmilus was a scavenger isn't a new one. It was first proposed 90 years ago by this guy, Elmer Riggs. Funnily enough, it was also once argued that Smilodon was a scavenger too. Anyway, let's run through the arguments. Professor Janus and colleagues based their case on several lines of reasoning. Firstly, they compared the biomechanical performance of the skull of Thylacosmilus to that of the flagship saber-toothed cat, Smilodon fatalis here. Using an approach we call finite element analysis, this is basically using computer simulations to compare levels of stress or strain under different scenarios. They found that Thylacosmilus' skull was better adapted to resist the forces generated by inserting the canines and pulling back than the saber cat was, but not as well designed to resist forces generated when using the neck muscles to pull the head down in order to insert the canines into the prey's flesh. They also proposed that the neck muscles that pulled the head down were not as well developed in Thylacosmilus as in Smilodon. The conclusion based on these interpretations was that Thylacosmilus could not have killed in the same manner as Smilodon, which the majority of specialists consider to be something called the canine shear bite. Basically, this is where the head depressing muscles are used to insert the canines with the lower jaw held in place against the body of the prey animal. Another possible mode of attack that has been proposed for some other saber-toothed species is called a head strike. This is more of a slashing action, but both approaches definitely require the use of head depressing neck muscles. Another argument raised is that Thylacosmilus lacked retractable claws and had a generally powerful bear-like build with a rigid lower back, but with relatively short limbs. And this led the authors to conclude that Thylacosmilus had neither the endurance to run down prey, nor the agility to rapidly lunge at prey and manipulate it in an ambush scenario. 
Christine and colleagues note three other features of significance. Thylacus malus lacks well-developed incisor teeth at the front of the jaw. Its cheek teeth behind the canines show no evidence of the kind of heavy wear that you'd expect in an animal that crushed bone, and careful examination of its skull anatomy suggested that it may have had a particularly well-developed tongue. So, in their opinion, Thylacus malus was unable to catch prey, and in the very unlikely event that it did, it was unable to kill it. The only function of its huge canines, then, must have been to open the carcasses of animals that had either naturally died or been killed by real predators, so that it could then just jump in, rip open the belly to access the flesh and soft internal organs, but definitely not bone. And further, that it might have used its particularly large, long tongue to get at these internal. Now, regarding the absence of retractable claws, others have previously proposed that this excluded Thylacus malus from being able to capture live prey. In 1987, Goyne and Pasquale made the same observation, but suggested that Thylacus malus may have rammed its prey to knock it down. Personally, I'm not sold on this particular interpretation. It's also previously been noted that the lower back of Thylacus malus was relatively rigid and that it was superficially more bear-like than living more agile cats. And that includes me in this 2007 paper. Now, many of these features observed by Janus and colleagues were also observed by Christine Argo in 2004 in a very detailed examination of Thylacus malus's postcranial anatomy. However, as noted by Argo, in these respects, Thylacus malus is actually very similar to the saber-cat Smilodon. Both species have powerful forelimbs, a generally more bear-like than cat-like build, and a rigid lower back. These features are also common to the muscle-bound marsupial lion, Thylacalea carnifex, which is also the subject of an earlier episode in this series. And if you've been watching, you will know that no one doubts whether either Smilodon or Thylacalea were serious predators. I've previously noted the similarities between Smilodon and the marsupial lion myself in this 2007 paper, How to Build a Mammalian Super Predator. So, all three of these chunky, superficially bear-like beasts have broadly similar bow plans. So, to my mind, the argument for a scavenging role over a predatory one seems to boil down to a couple of basic points. One, that less powerful head-depressing muscles meant that it could not kill prey using the same technique that Smilodon or other saber-tooths used, and secondly, that it lacked the ability to catch prey in the first place. But nonetheless, it must have had enough strength to drive its canines into the belly of an already dead animal and rip it open to suck out its soft but highly nutritious internal organs. So let's break this down. We'll look at the first proposition first. In 2013, myself and some colleagues ran a finite element analysis comparing Thylacus malus to both Smilodon and a leopard. We actually found that Thylacus malus was better adapted to drive its canines down into the prey than was the saber tooth, but not the leopard. But in this still more recent 2024 paper, Christine argues that this is unlikely because the area for the attachment of head depressing muscles is smaller in Thylacus malus. I would say in response that even if these particular neck muscles were relatively smaller in Thylacus malus, regardless, they still must have been powerful enough to drive through the skin and flesh of the animal, whether it was a scavenger or a predator. And a small attachment area doesn't necessarily mean that the muscles involved are actually small. This brings us to another potentially very important point. In our 2013 paper, we painstakingly reconstructed each of the actual muscles involved in both biting and pulling the head down. This doesn't appear to have been the case with respect to the models used in Christine's analysis. If so, then frankly, our modeling is more realistic and our results are a more reliable indicator of what was actually going on. Also worth noting is that the canines in Thylacus malus were ever growing, particularly sharp, and self-sharpening, unlike those of any other known saber tooth. And just as with a knife, the sharper the tooth, the less force is required to drive it into the prey. Again, of interest here is the fact that there is no need to assume 
that Thylacus smilus used the same biting technique as Smilodon or any other saber tooth for that matter. In this paper by Lattenschlager and others, who analysed a very wide range of mammalian saber tooths, it was concluded that different mammalian saber tooth species likely use their saber teeth to kill in a variety of different ways. And even with respect to Smilodon, it has been argued by Ackerston, 1987 here, that it actually killed its prey with a bite to the belly, not the neck. If Thylacus smilus had the means to drive its canines into the belly of a dead animal, as proposed by Christine and colleagues, there is no reason to exclude the possibility that it could have done the same to a living one. This brings us to the proposition that Thylacus smilus was incapable of catching prey in the first place. I've already pointed out a host of general similarities that it shares with both Smilodon and Thylacaleo, two pretty much undoubted super predators. This really just leaves two features unaccounted for, Thylacus smilus's relatively short limbs and its lack of retractable claws. I've got a bit to say here. Firstly, short limbs and a lack of retractable claws are both features of an earlier placental saber tooth radiation, the Macoroidines, and everybody agrees that these were effective predators. Janus argues that because these were much smaller than Thylacus smilus, we can't make an informed comparison between the two. Personally, I just don't see the logic in this. A big lion can be a hundred times larger than a small cat, but their anatomies, including the shape of their canines, are very similar, and they kill prey in much the same way, either a crushing bite to the base of the skull or neck, or a suffocating throat bite. The same can pretty much be said for all living cats. Short legs and a lack of retractable claws are also common to Thylacus smilus's closest South American relatives, the Borhainids. This family includes very large hypercarnivores like Proborhaena here. No one doubts that this family included powerful predators. Likewise, the largest living marsupial predators, the Tasmanian devil and spotted tail quoll, are also clearly capable of killing animals exceeding their own body weights, despite relatively short legs and non-retractable claws. Bears can catch and kill big prey too. And last but not least, living mustelids include a wide range of effective predators, from stoats to the wolverine, which all have relatively short legs and at best only semi-retractable claws. Lastly on this point, it's worth noting that Thylacus smilus, unlike its borhyenid relatives, had a semi-opposable thumb and relatively more powerful forelimbs that were better adapted to grasp and secure prey. There is one last, I think, compelling argument against the Thylacus smilus as scavenger proposition. If it was, then it is the only known instance of a mammalian scavenger that was unable to process bone, living or extinct. If it was really a scavenger, though, I absolutely agree that it would have preferentially gone for the supernutritious internal organs first, such as the heart, lungs and liver. In fact, most predators, mammalian or avian, preferentially go for these organs first. This means that if Thylacus smilus really was a scavenger, it would have had to get to that carcass really quick before any other predator or scavenger did. And the competition was fierce. It included at least three kinds of flightless terror bird, not to mention the mighty Argentavis, weighing in at around 70 kilo, with a wingspan of six and a half meters. The three terror birds were a small to medium size, maybe from around 10 to 70 kilos in weight. And some terror birds, of course, grew to be much bigger, but they weren't around in Argentina at the time. Anyway, it's thought that all of these were highly mobile and capable of covering considerable distances at speed. Now, Argentavis is thought to be a huge vulture-like scavenger, at best able to kill relatively small prey. Similarly, it's unlikely that any of these three terror birds were predators of particularly big prey either. But it's highly likely that they too were effective scavengers. This leads us to yet another question. If Thylacus smilus wasn't killing large prey, then who the hell was? There were no other big mammalian carnivores in Argentina at that time, and like I said, the biggest birds around weren't contenders for the role either. So, if Thylacus smilus truly was an obligate scavenger that couldn't catch and kill, and nobody else could either, then it would have had to hang around waiting for big herbivores to die of old age. It then just had to hope that it could get to their carcasses before any of these four much faster contemporaneous feathered scavengers could. Either way, even if any of these birds were capable of killing large prey, if Thylacus smilus didn't get to the kill real quick, 
the guts and other easily accessible morsels would have been gone, and we've already established that it couldn't have eaten the bones. Now, all this said, although obviously I disagree with the proposition that Thylacus Milus was a scavenger, I really do think that Professor Janus has really hit on something important here. Her insights have certainly convinced me that Thylacus Milus was specialised to consume the soft but nutrient-rich internal organs of large animals. But when you put it all together, I just think that it was Thylacus Milus that took down the large prey and then licked out their innards while a conga chain of feathered scavengers waited for the opportunity to pick up the remains. I just don't see how it could have worked the other way around. So that's my take on the great scavenger versus predator debate. Let me know what you think in the comments section. And if you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and let me know which potential super predator you'd like me to focus on next.